Welcome to 10 Minute KQL. These short 10 minute sessions will teach you KQL, allow you to get hands on practice in a lab environment, and provide some homework to practice after the session. This is the 11th video in the KQL Intermediate Series. In the last session, we learned the different types of KQL joins. In this session, we'll finish off our join series with a practical exercise and tie everything together. If you find value in these videos, please support the channel by hitting the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button with the notification bell. Let's work on a practical exercise and start out with a scenario and a vision of an output data set. Then let's build a query to satisfy that requirement. Here's the scenario. The security team has just received a user submitted report from Deborah West. It states that Deborah stepped away from her desk at 8.45 a.m. to eat breakfast on the 10th of January. When she came back, another coworker reported that a technician was seen at their workstation just after Deborah left and stated they were fixing some things. Deborah is concerned that her screen timeout of 15 minutes did not stop that person from accessing her work systems, particularly her email. Our job is to investigate to see what activity took place on the device. Deborah works in the New York City office of Envolve Labs, a global company with a remote security team. With that general information, we can develop a plan of action to investigate. To tackle this problem, let's first list out all the questions we want to answer. Then we'll determine which ones we can answer using KQL with the data sets that we have. We want to know what is the reporter's device? What activity has taken place? What files were accessed? Were any programs initiated? Was any information exfiltrated? We may also have some follow-on questions for the physical security team to understand if the worker was legitimate, how they gained access if they weren't, and many other investigative factors. For the digital investigation, normally we would go directly to AAD sign-in logs and use advanced hunting in the Unified Defender Portal. But in this scenario, we're working with small test data sets. Not all companies have robust security systems and logging, so this may simulate a company that needs additional telemetry. And after the investigation is complete, you can identify gaps and make recommendations. Let's see what information we have with the limited test data sets and do our best to work through the problem set. In this case, we can use the Security Logs database. We're new to these data sets, so let's sample them first and see what they contain. When we're looking at the data sets, we're looking for information of interest, as well as potential keys to tie different data sets together. First, let's look for our reporter in the data set and start there. We see we have an employees table, so let's take a sample and see what the table contains. We can see the reporter and see that it has the reporter's host name. That's a good start. We already have a couple pieces of our puzzle. Now let's look at some other tables and see if we can piece together even more information. When we look at the authentication events table, we can see it shows successful and failed logins. When we look at the fields, we see both the user agent and username. They were both on the previous table. We see a host name there as well, but it's the email server host. So we'll rename that in the future so there's no confusion. When we look at the file creation events table, we can see the host name along with files created. This may be useful as well, and we'll keep it in our back pocket. When we look at outbound browsing, we see IP addresses. We see the user agent and the URL for browsing. Lastly, when we look at process events, we can see the host name as a common field. As you looked at these tables, we saw many common fields like the host name, IP address, and the username. If we think about which table would be our anchor to start with if we chose to join data sets, which one would you select and why? In this case, we can start with the employees table and narrow it down to one row that has the reporter, their device, and their IP address. This can serve as an anchor that other tables can be joined to. If we narrow it down to one record, it could be our left table. And since it's already deduplicated with only one record, there'll be no issues using either an inner unique join or an inner join with other data sets. Let's make a variable with the first table, which includes filters for just the fields we need. When we finish our variable, let's test it out to make sure it works. Remember when we end our variable, we place a semicolon. 
You can choose to place it at the end of line 3, or you can place it on its own, on line 4. This doesn't change the functionality of the query at all. And some people choose to place a distinct visual marker between variables for ease of readability. So now we have five key fields, and we've tested the query to make sure it works. Let's try to join some additional data sets to add to our base employee data. As we resample the authentication data table, we can see it has the host name and username. In the second table, we've paired it down to the username of D West, then projected the columns of interest. Now let's use an inner join type since our left table is already deduplicated and see our output. We can see both tables join now, and we have two records of failed login attempts from the machine in question. Let's try to build a timeline of activity from many tables to see what actions took place in the last week so we have a baseline of activity as well as visibility into the vulnerable window. Now let's add in process events. When we resample the data set, we see the only common field is the host name. What would happen if we joined on the host name? Let's try it and see. When we already have two joined tables and we try to join a third table, the output of the first two joined tables becomes the new left table, and the third table becomes the right table. When we join on the host name, we see the join work, but there's a problem. Just because the host name was a match doesn't mean we matched on the same activity. Look at the two timestamp fields. They're marking different timestamps for the different activities. If we wanted to go back and see each record on its own unique row, how could we do it? If we union that data, we can stack the rows on top of each other and see a better timeline of events. Even though it has many fields empty and the data set is harder to use, it's one option of many to build an overall timeline in this scenario, since we're lacking the proper security tools. You can see we have three mini queries, and the final portion of the query is either joining or unioning the data together to help build a better picture of what occurred. Let's sort by the timestamp now in descending order. What if we also wanted to add outbound browsing data? Let's sample that data set as well. Let's try to filter now by IP. While joins are cleaner, you also have to be careful. Just because there's a matching field doesn't necessarily mean the two items on both tables combine to form the same logged event. It's better to have a correlation event or a unique identifier for that event to join on. In this case, the output is a little sloppy, but at this stage, it does show us a chronological order of authentication events, email activity, process events, and URLs navigated to in one output data set. Remember that Deborah works in New York City, and the timestamp is in UTC time. So let's build a five hour offset to account for the time change. We can do this with extend. When we test this out, we get an error. It says we can't do math with a string. When we use get schema, it confirms that the timestamp is in a string format. Let's cast it to a date time data type. When we run this query, we can now match up the dates and times of the report with the activity. Deborah said she left her desk at 8.45, and we see a failed login attempt at 8.50 when the repairman was at the computer. We're going to want to dig in a little deeper, since these logs look light on activity for us, so we'll meet with Deborah online shortly to investigate more. Of course, with a full set of Defender or Consolidated Sentinel logs, we'd likely have all the information needed to complete the investigation using KQL. But this example, with a practice sample logs, shows some of the possibilities of how to investigate, how to join tables, and some of the pitfalls you may encounter when working through new data sets. We hope you're feeling a little more comfortable with joins after this series, and have a better concept of how to tackle problems involving multiple tables. 
we have two more sessions left in the KQL Intermediate Series. We'll do a debugging challenge so we can learn how to write queries better by seeing what common mistakes are. We'll finish the Intermediate Series with a quiz to test your general knowledge. Then we'll move on to the Advanced Series. We'll see you in the next session. If you find value in these videos, please support the channel by hitting the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button with the notification bell.